the first instance, you'll be making a casting box from Melanex. You'll each have a square like this. Um, and ignore that horrible diagram that's in, in the first set of um, instructions. Follow this one on how to make the casting box. Okay? So, um, this has a, a hole in the bottom. Now, you note that it's not too close to the edge of or the, the outer corner of or the outer fold of the box. If you do it much bigger than that, uh, the pulp will escape out and you won't get a good result. So make sure that you've got the hole in roughly that kind of aperture. Obviously if you wanted to do a larger area, you would scale up the box. And you can do them, the, the apertures can be cut out, all different shapes, but for simplicity and uh, for an introduction it's best just to have a square. Okay. Um, they have a little tab that fits in the bottom, nice and snugly, and all of the creases have to be very, very sharp and make sure that the box, this is not brilliant, but sits quite snugly flat on the table, okay, otherwise the pulp again escapes. But we pour the pulp in there and release that like, you know, the tablecloth, mm -hmm. okay. and it's quite magical what happens on a very fresh table. So you'll be making that, and you can take that away, obviously, with you. Um, and you can use that for filling in voids um, in paper. You will have some of your own samples of paper that you'll want to trial. But um, I've also supplied some basic Aquel, 100% cotton, quite robust, but it's a typical um, drawing paper that you might be using. So you can cut them into little sample squares, and then you can try the casting box, different layers, different colours, uh, different burnishing techniques, etc. So the idea is to have a few sample sets um, that you can um, uh, take away with. Okay? But equally you can substitute this support for your own paper. But we'll be using a variety of uh, pulping papers um, in order to fill in the voids. Okay. Now the pulping papers that we have are the linters that you have to make paper in, in the studio, but also these specialised coloured papers, which um, again are linters, but they, they do have organic dyes in them. Um, so you can use these for contrast. Um, so what's a linter? A linter is, is, is a basic fibre that is uh, produced for making paper. So it's the, the raw materials for making paper. Um, and they're all made from cotton. And the ones that you brought over, cotton. Cotton linen. Cotton linen. These are cotton. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it doesn't have any... Yeah it's, yeah, it's formed into a sheet for convenience, but it doesn't have any fillers or uh, sizing agents, so it's just the raw material plus the colourant in, in the case of, of these. Um, so you can try different colours for, for contrast, or you can keep it, you know, simple, try different um, methods, but just with the same pulp. It's up to you how, how you want to, to work it. So it's um, more experimental today, really. So these are mini versions of the fact. Obviously, they're designed for infilling losses in works of art on paper. So we're looking for very different things like colour match, surface match, you know, quality and thickness. But you may be exploiting all that. You might be doing contrast of colour, contrast of texture, um, contrast of thickness or transparency. So th there's all different um, approaches you could take. Um, so these are little squares. I don't know, yours will be bigger. But they have holes cut out, but you can just um, cut your own shape out, it, it doesn't make any difference. And then they're filled with different pulping colours, so you can pass those around. Obviously these are to match, you know, artworks, but um, it'll give you some idea. Um, you might wonder what these little sweeties are. Um, 
These are reference sets, so we won't be using them today. But um, in the future, we have the potential to do a workshop where we're using colorants to dye the basic linter paper using um, different um, organic dyes like yasha cones, all sorts of, we've got a lot of Japanese materials in the building, and adding different mordants to the pulp produces a whole range of colours and concentrations. So um, this one, for instance, is a white pulp where it was yashikones with an iron-based mordant. So you get an intense sort of almost greyish black colour. Whereas the same with a chrome is very different. Now I don't know how we would fare with the health and safety because these mordants are um, fairly toxic, but we could use direct dyes which um, don't need any mordanting, um, which um, you just add the colorant to the paper and they bond quite successfully with the cellulose without any bridging complex like alum. Sorry, what's a mordant? A mordant is something that actually um, produces a greater affinity with, with the cellulose structure. So it act, acts as a bridging complex, i.e. I, if you have... Um, um, who's got a pencil? Okay, so if you have the, the cellulose, um, or the, the molecule in, in the paper, or the fibre, okay? And then the dye, okay? So the dye... Um, it depends on what, what it is, what the, the raw material is, but it will settle around the fibre, but it won't make a chemical bond with it. So if you add a mordant to it, which is obviously added to, sometimes there's a mordant in process which is separate, like in textile dyeing, but generally we add the mordant to the, to the pole, the, to the dye, I should say. So that increases its affinity for the cellulose, but also it likes the dye. So this mordant attaches itself to the cellulose molecule. It also attaches itself to the dye. So chemica uh, chemically? There's a it's chemical not just a bond. physical bond, it's a chemical yeah, bond. Yeah, it's a chemical bond. A direct dye um, is uh, something that um, will have a slightly um, more permanent attraction forces, so you don't need a mordant. So does that mean then, um, is, it, is it like if you uh, put salt with um, an oil dye, it kind of sets it, yeah. Yeah. so does it stop it from, <coughs> if, if, if colour fades um, on papers, mm -hmm. is that to do with any chemical bonding or is it to do with? Well, it does affect um, the light aging characteristics. It can stabilise and, and make it more light fast. Right. Not in every case, it depends what the dye is to, to begin with. If it's um, an organic, then it will have a high propensity to, to decolorize over a few years, especially in strong light. But quite a lot of the mordants do reduce that light damaging effect. But on the other hand, because they can be acidic and iron based, they, ha they can have corrosive effects long term as well. So. It swings in roundabouts. Um, but yes, it can affect the light stability, but not in every case. Okay. Um, but salt, yes, it helps it key on to the cellulose structure, yeah. or the, the fabric, as opposed to stabilizing it as such. Or yes, yeah. It's just in my terminology. Very basic terms, <laughs> I think. But yeah. uh, that's yeah. another workshop, really, because uh, at least a two days, probably three days workshop to do that. Mm -hmm. um, that would be very um, interesting. <coughs> we could just have workshops every day until all the people have to do that. I could ditch it, though. I think it would give me uh, you know, uh, permission. I'll ditch the paper, the paper conservation students. And I mean, this is, Come this, over to this is actually a serious, serious comment, um, I'm not, but I'm not suggesting that we, we use it for it. Um, I know when the chemicals, when they, the more that they used for, for natural dyes was urine. Oh, yes, urine. Yeah. I think it's an interview also. Right, yeah. Right. Oh, yes, yeah. yeah, no, that's, um, 
Yeah, common. No, that we don't use it in no. conservation. No. But we use pigments that were made through um, cow's urine, mm. which is um, Indian mm. yellow. Yeah, so it's it. uronic acid. <laughs> yeah, but it's a, it's a very effective um, modern. Um, and urine was made in, uh, used a lot in um, alum making as well. You know in Yorkshire, North Yorkshire, you have the cliffs there where the natural alum is extracted. Um, so you've got these big lumps of rock and they're fermented over a long period of time and burnt and charred. But then the next stage is to the interaction with urine and these poor old people that worked in the alum works. They were like pariahs of society because not only were they working with this stinking thing, but they used to have to go and collect people's urine. Mm -hmm. um, so they fast works in North Yorkshire, you can see them in the cliff. But alum was a very important commodity for medicinal, for textiles, I mean, paper, just a very small aspect of alum use. Mm -hmm. um, but it is acidic, very acidic, and it uh, accounts for. The majority of uh, paper deterioration in machine made papers in the 19th and early 20th century. You know, that brittle paper you get in books has to be um, largely. Anyway, so um, step one is making the box with, with those instructions. And if you make that fairly quickly, then, then we can do the demonstration um, shortly after that. Um, I'm also going to show you how to prepare the pulp ready for this local application. It's slightly different from making a sheet of paper, but the principles are the same. And then you, you decide yourself whether you're going to use these supports that I've given you. If you want to try some other Japanese papers, I've probably got some, um, but you can also try all the papers that you've brought. But I would do some sample sets like that with a hole in the middle so you can try different pulps and techniques and pressing. Does it have off. to be square? Can I use a different shape? No, you can use a different yeah. shape. Yes, <laughs> um, Oblong or ovals or whatever. It doesn't matter. Or even just random. It doesn't matter. Um, so the, the pulp, and again, this is um, uh, looking at infilling works of art. But this is the kind of very smooth transition that you can get with paper pulp. Normally we would apply obviously the paper pulp from the verso because we don't want the excess to cover any of the design. But you may find that that is part of your aesthetics and, uh, and the result. But you can see how the transition is very smooth. But you can also exploit the, you know, the thickness. You can make it thicker or more textured. Remember the, the pulp is very soft and whatever pressing material that you put in contact with that soft pulp will impart to a greater or le lesser extent onto the support. Now this is a Japanese um, paper and fiber. Japanese um, I can feel that. Yes, yes, you can take it out. That's um, another data. Um, yeah, Japanese paper is not fantastic for pulping because it's so long, the fibres, and they tend to coagulate. Um, and because we don't have the, you, you remember the mucilage, for those who attended the lectures, um, which coats the fibres and, and disperses them more evenly, we don't have access to to our eye root, so it's, um, it tends to clump a lot more. But you can have a go with some Japanese um, papers to see what the results are. You may want it more coagulated and clumpy. Um, but generally we use cotton or linen-based papers because, again, they're quite long fibres, but they're not too long that they disperse and you get um, a more even application. But obviously... That's not always what we want. So that's the, um, the the pulping and the kind of results that you, you can get. Um, so we'll be doing the box. We'll also be casting um, 
if you don't have a low pressure table, which I'm sure most people don't, um, then you can apply pulp in situ over a light box, providing your object can be uh, wetted down significantly. Okay? So if you've got something with sensitive media that might bleed out, then you won't be able to use uh, the light box technique. Um, in conjunction with the, the box on the low pressure table, it will also be pipetting um, slurry into various block voids as well. You can keep these um, loose up. <laughs> um, we normally um, trim them off so they're slightly fatter. So, but you can pipette the slurry into different areas and then compact it down like a mini sheet of paper. But you do really need um, suction or the low pressure table to do that. Um, but I'll show you those two. Things. And then lastly, um, the pe paper slurry that we're making, we're going to tease out um, some Japanese fibres um, that we've pulped. And then I'll show you how to individually tease them out and paste them up. And you, you might find this an interesting technique. Obviously this is for repair. But individual fibres laid across a tear in order to support them like um, paper stitches. But you could use that decoratively. You could use it to um, you know, join two sheets of diaphanous paper or slightly, slightly thicker. So they're like paper stitches. Wow. And again, you know, you can add um, colorants to them to make them more contrasty. But you need Japanese fibers for that, not not this type of paper. So that's where it does come into its own, the long fibers. Is Kozo okay for that? Yeah, absolutely. That's what we see.